Hi, everyone. In our other PowerPoints in this unit, we focused on officers and directors. And I wanted to just spend a few minutes also going over the role of shareholders. Clearly, we've already talked about shareholders, and there's a lot also packed into the chapter in your book, but I just want to highlight a few pieces here. So the first thing I want to talk about is who can be a shareholder. We've already talked about how shareholders are the owners of a company, the owners of a corporation, or also called the investors. So who can be a shareholder? Well, any individual can be a shareholder, but also entities can be shareholders in corporations. So this would include pension plans, mutual funds, hedge funds, and the list here. And I want you to just refer back to the differences between a C corporation and an S corporation. One of those differences are the limitations on who can be a shareholder. So I won't use time in this PowerPoint now, but I wanna make sure that you know the differences between who is allowed to be a shareholder in each type of entity, because to be a shareholder, well, I should say it this way, in a C corporation, almost any entity can be a shareholder, but there are limits in, limits in, S, corp, in S corporations. So why did I write the word activist shareholder at the bottom of this page? This is an interesting question and kind of goes back to a little bit of what we talked about in the officer and director PowerPoint, which is the role of the shareholders. Remember the shareholders are owners. So it's a tough place for them because to a large extent, they want to be able to direct the direction of the company. Right. If you own a majority share or even a minority share of a corporation, you might want a say in how that company is run. But how much say is too much say? And over the years, we've seen a growth of shareholders taking on a more activist role in how a company is run. Clearly, shareholders have always enjoyed the right to vote in the directors. But then for you know, generations, the, the role of the shareholder was a little bit more to sit back and let the directors take the, di the company in the direction that they wanted to go. But we've seen now a growth of what we call the activist shareholder, which is the idea that, yes, I have some rights to vote, but I might exercise more of my support for the direction of a company than in prior years. Shareholder role is the same, but how you take on that responsibility has changed. Okay, so what can shareholders do? As we just mentioned, their right is that of an ownership. Their right in a, as a shareholder in a company is not to manage. So even though we just mentioned that some shareholders are taking on a more activist role, it's not a role that is traditionally delegated to shareholders and not one that is recognized in the law as a role for the shareholder. So what do shareholders have the right to do besides mere ownership? I mean, we own a lot of things. I own the mouse next to my computer. I own the water bottle next to me here. Clearly owning shares in, company, in a company is a little different than that. So the first important piece is that shareholders have the right to information. Shareholders as owners cannot be kept in the dark. That means shareholders have the right to review minute books and look at accounting records. But the one caveat here is that companies need to be protected from abuse. Because what we don't wanna happen is for every shareholder to just pick up the phone or send an email and say, I'm coming over, show me all your records. A shareholder has the right to this information, but it must be for what the law calls a proper purpose. And the opposite of that would be harassment, you know, just harassing the company to try to get this information or what we've called like a phishing expedition, like, I, you know, a shareholder might suspect something is wrong, but has no basis in, in any anything and just wants to go on a phishing expedition. I mentioned the Chopra case here. Make sure you look at that one in your textbook. It's a really good example of how the court discusses the difference between a shareholder's right to information for a legitimate purpose and one that's more of a fishing expedition or harassment. So here we go. One important right for shareholders is the right to information. A second important right that belongs to shareholders is approving really significant corporate changes. Remember about the roles of the officers, directors, and shareholders. So the officers are managing the day-to-day -day business. The board of directors is making big picture decisions. But pursuant to the bylaws of corporations and corporate law, the shareholders have the right to approve 
many of those corporate changes. For example, a couple of units ago, we talked about the charter as being the document that establishes the corporation within a particular state. If there's going to be an amendment to the charter, shareholders get to approve or vote against that corporate change. Amending the bylaws, if the company is considering buying or selling major assets or even getting into a merger situation, these are all areas where shareholders have a right to approve these corporate changes. So you can start to see here how even though the law designates these distinct roles of shareholder, officer, and director, they each have a particular role to play and they each have some measure of control over how the corporation is run. All right, so we've got right to information, right to approve corporate changes. Now, what about that word fiduciary duty? So remember that we just spent some time really over the last couple of weeks talking about this fiduciary duty, this obligation. We just learned this obligation of directors and officers to act in the best interest of the company and to protect the shareholders. Because remember, the shareholders are the reason the company is there. They're the investors and the owners. And we just talked in the last slide with directors about what happens if directors do not live up to their fiduciary duty, if they breach the fiduciary duty. So take a look. Again, I won't use the time in the PowerPoint to talk about it, and we can also bring it up on our discussion board, but take a look at the case between eBay and Craigslist. Really fascinating case about what it means to have a fiduciary duty that protects the shareholders. I think this is one of the most interesting cases in your, in your textbook, so take a look at it. Last but certainly not least, shareholders have the right to vote. We've already mentioned this one. This is a hugely important right for the shareholders because the only reason the board of directors, the individuals sit in those positions is because they have been voted in by the shareholders. Shareholders generally vote annually. They've always been able to vote by proxy. So if you can't make a meeting in person, you can always have someone vote on your behalf. And many companies, certainly since the pandemic time, have moved to online voting. It's not like you have to show up in person to cast your vote. And this is a really important right because it gives shareholders the right to, to see the direction of the company where they want it to go by who they vote in on their board of directors. So those are some of the important pieces that I want you to know about the role of shareholders. I didn't put it on the slide, but there is one other thing mentioned in your book that I think is worth looking at, and that is shareholder lawsuits. I mean, we've talked about the breach of fiduciary duty, but I want you to take a look and just also know the difference between a direct lawsuit and a shareholder derivative, derivative lawsuit. There's not a lot in the book about that, but take a look at it because that's also an important right of the shareholders. It gives them another measure of protection. All right, not too long a PowerPoint this time.